welcome to another mini med school seminar that's brought to you by the Women's Heart Health Initiative at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. The aim of our Women's Heart Health Initiative has been to empower women and men with the knowledge about various topics related to heart health. Today, we're here to discuss a very important topic, atrial fibrillation, which is defined as an abnormal heart rhythm that affects millions of Americans. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our wonderful panel of expert physicians, all of whom are from Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Elaine Wan is a cardiac, cardiac electrophysiologist and the Esther Abudi Assistant Professor of Medicine. Dr. Eliza Miller is a neurologist at Columbia University and is a specialist in vascular neurology as well as women's cardiovascular health and neurology. Dr. Vivian Ng is an interventional cardiologist who has an expertise in structural heart disease. So we are very excited to have this exceptional panel of experts who are going to share their expertise about this important topic. We're here to talk about the beat of your heart and atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation? AFib or atrial fibrillation is a type of arrhythmia that occurs where the atria are contracting irregularly. What that means, basically the atria are the two top chambers of the heart, as you can see here. The ventricles are the bottom chambers of the heart that are responsible for pumping blood to the rest of the body. And when you have atrial fibrillation, instead of there being one message, one electrical pathway that goes from one, the pacemaker node of the heart uh, to the electrical system of the heart so that it's done in orderly fashion, atrial fibrillation actually means that these impulses are coming from, um, from all over in a scattered, irregular manner in the atria. Um, and so that can be very fast at times. It can be, it's very irregular by definition, and it can impair the way that the left ventricle actually fills. And so this is where some of the symptoms that we're going to talk about arise. It affects about 3 million adults in the United States, and there's actually an expected rise quadrupling in the next decade. And part of this is because people are living for longer, but also because some of the comorbidities that are associated with atrial fibrillation that we're going to talk about um, are actually on the rise, things such as diabetes and obesity, um, high blood pressure. A person's lifetime risk of atrial fibrillation is over 20%. And actually, after the age of 75, it's predominantly women who are affected. 60% of women with, or people with AFib um, after the age of 75 are actually women. So what are some of these risk factors and what can you do uh, to identify atrial fibrillation early um, as well as prevent it hopefully in the future? So first and foremost, it's not listed on this slide, but definitely see a doctor on a regular basis. I think one of the most important things that you can do is have regular heart health maintenance. And this is something that we've talked about um, over and over again in the in past seminars. Some of the other risk factors for development of atrial fibrillation include alcohol abuse. Um, this is something that's uh, more of a risk in women than it is in, in men. Um, there's something called holiday heart syndrome, where it's actually been described that acute ingestion of uh, a lot of alcohol can actually result in atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, smoking is also something that's associated with a significantly higher risk, and that includes actually secondhand smoke that occurs while somebody is in gestation, so when, when somebody is pregnant, um, or during childhood that actually pre predisposes people for future atrial fibrillation risk. Um, obesity is also on the rise, uh, as everyone knows, but uh, is also significantly associated with development of atrial fibrillation. It's an independent risk factor. And um, about 18% of atrial fibrillation could be prevented by achieving an optimal BMI. So with each one point rise in BMI, the atrial fibrillation risk rises by about four to 8%. And then going alongside with obesity, of course, is the rise in diabetes in the U.S. And um, with each 1% increase in the hemoglobin A1c, atrial fibrillation risk is increased by 13%. So clearly having uh, an unhealthy lifestyle as well as risk factors that are risk factors for cardiovascular disease um, also predispose for atrial fibrillation. Hypertension is probably the most important contributor to atrial fibrillation, and that includes um, prehypertension. But uh, that also is something that is modifiable that's within a person's control. 
Obstructive sleep apnea, which goes alongside obesity as well, is when somebody has apnea while they're sleeping. It's often undiagnosed, but this can be an independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And of course, having underlying heart disease or heart failure, um, there is a strong correspondence with the development of atrial fibrillation as well. There is some uh, familial risk factors that exist. It's particularly in those young, in young people who develop atrial fibrillation, who have no other risk factors, none of these other things that are on the slide. Um, and it's, it's something called lone atrial fibrillation or lone AF. Um, it happens amongst young people. It's rare, but there is some sort of genetic correspondence. It's certainly not um, the, the majority of patients. So there was actually um, a review article in one of our major cardiology journals um, a couple of years ago that talked about atrial fibrillation as a preventable disease. And so if you could, if you could optimize all of these risk factors that I listed on the previous slide, the present distribution is two to 16% of the population with this many people being in high risk. Um, in the high-risk category, and if you had optimal distribution, meaning controlling smoking, controlling alcohol intake, controlling blood pressure, diabetes, weight, um, you could actually significantly reduce the number of patients who are at high risk. So now that I've scared you enough, what are some of the risks or what are what some of the symptoms of atrial fibrillation? Um, the about a third of patients are absolutely asymptomatic. So this person um, who has no symptoms at all. Um, other symptoms can include um, palpitations. That's probably the most common um, for people who do feel when they're in atrial fibrillation. Palpitations or an irregular heart fluttering um, can, uh, can occur. There can also, because it's not letting the heart fill adequately with blood the way it normally would, um, it can lead to dizziness or height, lightheadedness, which can be due to not circulating enough blood um, with each heartbeat. Shortness of breath or um, feeling tired or fatigued is something that can also be reported. And, um, and chest pain, again, if it, chest pain by itself shouldn't be from atrial fibrillation, but if it's associated with underlying heart disease, that may be a sign. Um, or if it's going very fast and you have underlying heart disease, that may be the presenting sign of atrial fibrillation. So if, if a third of people are asymptomatic, why should it matter if somebody is in atrial fibrillation? Why do you need to know? Well, there are some long-term, or not even that long-term, but some downstream sequelae that can happen as a result of having atrial fibrillation, one of which is a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So that sounds complicated, but what it means is basically that your heart's beating so fast for so long, even if you don't feel it, um, that it just makes the, the heart muscle tired and that the pump function of the heart can be reduced. This is luckily something that if it's identified early um, can be reduced or, or um, can be reversed by controlling the heart rate, getting people out of atrial fibrillation. Um, and then more importantly, there is a risk of future stroke. So people with atrial fibrillation need to be identified early. And the reason is that um, if somebody stays in atrial fibrillation, because the atria are contracting in this chaotic way, where it's not a normal squeezing, a synchronized squeeze, squeezing, there's parts of the heart um, where you can develop a blood clot. And we're going to talk about this more in, the fu in, in a, a future lecture uh, by our other experts. But if a person stays in atrial fibrillation for more than a number of hours um, and are not on a blood thinner, they are, can be at a risk of stroke. And some of the things that uh, predict who is at risk um, is, on, is on this table on the right. So if a per patient has congestive heart failure, if they have hypertension, if they're over 75, if they have diabetes, a prior stroke or TIA, um, any vascular disease, if they have a borderline age, so there's a score system, or if they're women, um, there's a score system that happens. And if they have a score of greater than or equal to two in men or greater than or equal to three in women, they should be placed on blood thinners to prevent this risk of stroke in the future. Of course, anybody who's on blood thinners is also at risk of bleeding. So it, this is something that needs to be identified and talked about individualized for each person. And then there's also a higher risk of future dementia in patients who have atrial fibrillation. That's thought to be because of sort of micro strokes um, that can happen as a result, even if they're on blood thinners. But again, I, I'll, I'll defer this um, to our neurologist who's gonna speak in just a few moments. So how do we diagnose AFib? Um, 
So if a person is in atrial fibrillation at the time of their doctor's appointment or, you know, ER visit, what have you, um, the, an EKG will be able to identify atrial fibrillation. The way that it does that is that in a normal rhythm, in a normal sinus rhythm, there's atrial contraction, this P wave that happens before this big upstroke, um, and it's in an orderly way. It's all organized activity. Here you can see, and you don't have to be an expert at looking at EKGs to see this, but there's a squiggly baseline. It means there's no organized atrial activity. There's no P wave that's seen up here. And so that just shows the irregular nature of atrial fibrillation. Um, if, there, if it's suspected that somebody is going in and out of atrial fibrillation, which often happens when atrial fibrillation starts, it's often paroxysmal or come, comes and goes. Um, so if it's something where patients are getting symptoms um, for you know, every day for a couple hours each day, um, a 24 hour Holter monitor versus having something longer if symptoms are coming every few days, then you may wanna do an event monitor, um, which is, you know, two to four weeks of, uh, of a monitor to see if somebody is going in and out of atrial fibrillation. Um, and then if somebody is, especially if they're particularly, if they're very symptomatic, if they're getting lightheaded, possibly even passing out, um, that could be something that's more serious, somebody that you'd want to identify earlier and definitely have a higher uh, threshold of testing. Um, you can also do an implantable loop recorder, which is something that gets implanted under the skin. It's minimally invasive. It's nothing that's, um, you know, of any concern, but, uh, but it is something that can, be, that can stay in for longer um, and can identify any arrhythmias. They would, the, the company would then notify the implanting physician um, when there is an, an abnormal heart rhythm that could cause symptoms, could, that could be causing worrisome symptoms. Um, all patients that have atrial fibrillation or have any sort of arrhythmia really should have blood work that also rules out underlying causes. So that includes, you know, ruling out infection, ruling out thyroid disease, um, any electrolyte abnormalities, and typically an echocardiogram or a sonogram of the heart would also be done to make sure that there's no structural heart disease. And if it's thought that it's due to some underlying coronary condition, um, patients may also undergo stress testing or cardiac catheterization, but again, that's individualized to each person and whatever their medical history is. So hopefully that provides a background for um, you know, what atrial fibrillation is, the symptoms and who should be weary, who's at most risk. The big takeaway, if you're going to mem remember anything, is that um, seeing your doctor and getting, you know, regular cardiovascular prevention is probably the most important thing. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Elaine Wan. Dr. Wan is the Esther Abudi professor, Assistant Professor in Cardiology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She's a cardiac electrophysiologist with an expertise in atrial fibrillation and women's heart health. So I hand it over to her. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jelani, and I'm uh, really excited to be on this panel. Um, I just want to introduce myself and what I do. Um, so my name is Dr. Elaine Wan. I'm a Director of Electrophysiology Research um, at Columbia. And what is electrophysiology? Well, if you think about the heart as a house, um, there's electricity and also plumbing in a house, and I'm your electrician. So if there's something wrong with any rhythm disturbance, uh, the electricity of the heart, um, I'm the specialist that you go to. I'm trained in cardiology, but I did a um, specialty training um, in electricity of the heart. And you'll meet later one of my colleagues, Dr. Ng, who specializes really in the blood vessels and the valves and the structure of the heart. And you can think of her as probably the plumber of the house to keep everything um, functioning. So I just wanted to discuss a little bit about about um, the options um, when I see patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, definitely in my last seven years of practice, I can say undoubtedly that the number of patients with atrial fibrillation is growing, just like Dr. Jelani says. And it's probably because um, we're living longer lives. Um, also, we might be becoming a little bit more and more obese with a plentiful uh, diet around and also uh, underlying conditions need to be better treated. So definitely high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart failure. Um, Dr. Miller, who you'll meet later, um, is 
just like me, we work together in the mother center where we deal with pregnant women uh, who might have different um, cardiovascular and neurological diseases. So I've definitely taken care of pregnant women or expecting mo mothers who have um, cardiac arrhythmias. So I'm gonna go straight into what are the different um, things we can do for atrial fibrillation. Definitely, if you are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, a regularly irregular heartbeat, you can you do not have to accept the diagnosis. What that means is that there's definitely something we can do about it. And I hope that's the take home message today that there are different options um, that can be available to you um, to treat atrial fibrillation and be free of it. And I think Dr. Jolly mentioned um, very well about the different options just for screening, monitoring to know whether or not you have atrial fibrillation. Um, many people today have an Apple Watch that looks at their heart rate and whether or not it's a regular or regular, um, there are a lot of wearables available. That's definitely a way to screen yourself or to be aware whether or not you might have arrhythmia. But let's say you have an arrhythmia and you've discussed with your um, cardiac electrophysiologist and your cardiologist uh, what your different options are, which may include a blood thinner or medication to control the rate. Um, but some patients, they're highly symptomatic from atrial fibrillation. That means that they feel their heart is a flutter. They might feel dizzy, weak, or tired, or really run out because their heart is uh, running at a very fast and irregular rate. Then what can we do about it? Well, when conservative medical management doesn't really work, the option would be an invasive procedure called cardiac ablation. And this is a video that I've prepared um, about an animation to discuss what can be possible. So a quick way to get you out of it is really to do a cardioversion, which is where we put pads on the chest. And when you're asleep with an, from an anesthesia um, sedation, we basically shock your heart back to normal. But that is a temporary solution. That means the atrial fibrillation can come back. So the other option is to do this ablation where we go from the leg all the way to the heart, a catheter, and it goes basically from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart where the atrial fibrillation comes from from the pulmonary veins and we take a catheter that really maps the electrical abnormal electrical activity in the heart and you see that there's basically a technician where as we're burning away the areas of the heart where the abnormal rhythm is coming from we have a 3d map of your heart and we have a personalized therapy for every patient so here there's a catheter that basically burns away at the heart tissue um, that causes these abnormal heart rhythms therefore restoring normal heart rhythm this procedure can go anywhere between one to three hours, depending on the complexity. Every patient is different and we have a different ablation strategy for each patient. Um, it is under, done under general anesthesia or moderate sedation, so you're completely asleep so that you would not feel um, any um, discomfort during the procedure. So this is definitely a possibility for treatment. And I wanted to make um, all of you who are listening uh, aware that this is something that can be done that would either reduce or possibly um, allow for freedom from arrhythmias. Um, I just recently came back from a fantastic conference called the Heart Rhythm Society, which is specialized for um, specialists just myself that focuses on treatment and the newest technology and treatment modalities for patients with all types of arrhythmia. So there was a late breaking trial that really shows patients um, with early control of their heart rhythm, either using a catheter ablation or medication to control their heart rhythm can really be beneficial and allow them to be free or not develop um, any signs and symptoms of heart failure, which is weakening of the heart muscle. So definitely rhythm control offers clinical benefit and should definitely be um, considered um, within one year of diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And it can definitely reduce important outcomes for patients, including hospitalization, heart failure, stroke, and cardiovascular death. So this take home message from this slide is, if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, um, do something about it don't wait on it. Definitely talk to your cardiologist and your physician. Uh, what are the options for you? And definitely the best educated patient uh, will definitely have better outcomes. And this is what we really want to encourage you to do. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there is so many different wearables available today. And um, this paper is coming out in the Cardiovascular Digital Health Journal, which is a white paper from the Heart Rhythm Society, which is a national and international society about all the uh, electrophysiologists, what we think and feel uh, as a group about 
wearables and digital health. And I'm the first author of this paper. And where, actually there's so many wearables um, that is available to consumers, to pick people like you. So if you go online, you can look at the Apple Watch. There's probably the Cardia, which is like a case um, or just two electrodes that connects to your smartphone. Now there are rings like the Aura ring. There's also chest straps. Um, there's also wristbands like the Fitbit uh, or the Hoop. And what information can you get from that? Well, there's a lot. Um, you can get information such as heart rate using um, PPG technology, which is a light that looks on your skin tone. You can also get um, an electrocardiogram, and most recently, uh, the Cardia can even offer a six-lead EKG. Um, you can also get wireless blood pressure monitoring and also pulse oximetry, and also measure your activity during the day, and also your heart rate variability as you move um, during the day and during the night to see whether or not you have a good heart condition. So what do we do with all this information? One, the most important thing is that if you're concerned about any of the finding that your wearable um, detects is to discuss with your physician. Because definitely these wearables may not be appropriate for all patients because they have variable amounts of accuracies in different skin tones, wrist sizes, um, bass, uh, body mass index, excuse me, um, and also uh, what activity you do. So definitely if you're a more active patient um, and your heart rate is very high, the accuracies may not be um, as good for you. You. And so if you think you might have arrhythmia, the best thing to do is to discuss with your physician where they can really have um, a physician monitored a monitor like what Dr. Jolly talked about, either a loop recorder or event uh, monitor to see whether or not indeed you have um, a heart arrhythmia. But all of these um, devices which are available to really anyone as it would help us detect whether or not you have an arrhythmia at risk for arrhythmia, or if you did have arrhythmia, if the medication management or the surgical treatment that you had uh, was actually treating uh, the, the, the cardiovascular issue you had. Um, finally, I just want to talk about the um, risk from any of these procedures, such as AFib ablation um, or uh, a cardioversion, which is external electric shock while you're asleep. The risk of all these procedures are fairly low. So in discussion with your physician, there will definitely be a benefit versus risk discussion tailored for each patient, whether or not the procedure is right for you. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eliza Miller, who's a specialist of, of the brain and neurologist at Columbia. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here, and those talks have been so interesting. I've learned a lot. Um, my name is uh, Eliza Miller. I'm a vascular neurologist at Columbia. So um, just like Dr. Wan was talking about being the electrician of the heart and that our colleague is a plumber of the heart, so I'm sort of like a plumber of the brain. And um, just like the heart, the brain also has electricity and plumbing. And I'm going to talk today about the relationship between atrial fibrillation and stroke, which is really one of the most feared complications of AFib. So I'm going to start just by reviewing what is a stroke, because um, a lot of people don't really know what it is. And so what it is, it's a blockage of a blood vessel in the brain, so like a clogged pipe which causes the surrounding area of the brain to become damaged and to die. So it's actually very, very similar to a heart attack where you get a blocked blood vessel in the heart, um, or we call that a myocardial infarction, which basically just means damaged or dead tissue in the heart. Well, in the brain, it's the exact same thing, but we call it a cerebral infarction or stroke. Now, what's different about stroke is there's also other kinds of strokes due to rupture of a blood vessel in the brain. So you can get a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a very um, serious kind of stroke. And so we always have to balance um, when we're talking about these blood thinners, for example, one of the very feared complications of being on them would be to have bleeding in the brain, which can obviously be fatal. So stroke is really common. Almost 800,000 new or recurrent strokes happen every year in the United States, and more than half of them are in women. So the lifetime risk of stroke is higher in women than in men, and 60% of stroke-related deaths are in women. And um, actually, the uh, 
overall, the incidence of stroke has been decreasing a little bit in the general population, but it's decreased more in men than in women, and it remains um, the fourth leading cause of death in women, but it's the fifth leading cause in men. So women are more likely to have their first cardiovascular event be a stroke versus an MI or heart attack in men women are more likely to have a stroke first, and the disability after stroke is higher in women than men. Women tend to be older at the time that they have a stroke, and they're more likely to have been living alone at that time. They're more likely to be institutionalized after a stroke, like in a nursing home. And as our population ages, we're seeing a higher and higher burden of stroke and dementia in women. And interestingly, stroke is a major risk factor for dementia. So um, if you have a stroke, you're at risk for major cognitive decline afterwards. So how does AFib lead to having a stroke? Well, you remember I mentioned about the blocked pipe in the brain. And here is an example of that. You're probably not used to looking at brain scans, but this is one of the big arteries in the brain. It's called the left middle cerebral artery. And you can see here that here it is coming into the brain and then it just stops. And the reason it stops is that it's blocked by a blood clot. And so if you remember um, how Dr. Jelani at the beginning was talking about when the, there are areas of the heart that are not contracting well, that clots can form. Well, one of the things that can happen is that a little clot can come from the heart and go floating up through the arteries that lead to the brain. And then as those arteries get smaller and smaller, the clot can get stuck there and it causes a stroke. And you can see here, this is a stroke that's in the whole area of the brain that's being supplied by this artery. And unfortunately, this is an area of the brain, this is a quite common artery to get blocked by a, a stroke like this. And this area of the brain is um, the left side of the brain, everything's backwards in brain scans, and it controls the right side of the body and also speech and language. So somebody who has this kind of stroke is going to really be quite disabled by it, probably unable to walk, unable to speak. It's really quite terrifying. But fortunately, AFib-related stroke is preventable. So AFib is, accounts for about a quarter of strokes in older patients over the age of 80. And as we heard, many, many older people with AFib are women. And interestingly, women who have AFib who are older actually have higher stroke risk than men, but they're less likely to be put on anticoagulation or those blood thinners, despite having a higher chads vask score, which is that score that Dr. Jelani talked about. They are less likely to be put on anticoagulation, and we're not exactly sure why that is, but sometimes people worry that they might fall, that they might have higher bleeding risk. Um, but actually they have higher stroke risk if they're not on anticoagulation. And if they are on anticoagulation, the benefit is greater in women than in men. And that's on the sort of older blood thinner, which is warfarin or Coumadin. And then on these newer blood thinners that we have that tend to have lower risk of bleeding, there was a big paper that analyzed four different clinical trials and it showed that women actually had lower bleeding risk than men. So there's really no reason not to put a woman on blood thinners unless she has a personal um, contraindication to it. For example, if she has had a lot of bleeding before or she's, um, she's at higher risk of bleeding, but otherwise women, it's really important that they be on these blood thinners because what those blood thinners do is they prevent the formation of those little clots in the heart. And if they don't form, then they won't float up and go and get stuck and cause a stroke. What if a stroke actually happens? Is there anything that we can do about it? once it's happened? Well, yes, we do have treatments for stroke. And actually, one of the reasons that stroke is such an exciting field to be in right now is that the treatment of stroke has really been revolutionized in the last 20 years, and especially in the last five years or so. And it's really a rapidly changing field. But we have two treatments that we can offer for stroke right now. And one of them is called TPA. Um, people might 
hear about it as the clot buster medicine. It's a very, very strong blood thinner, stronger than any of the ones you would just be on normally. And it can actually dissolve a clot if there's a clot stuck there. Um, and the catch is that we can only give it within the first few hours after the stroke starts. And we count when it starts from the last time the person was seen normal. So that's really important to remember if you're um, bringing someone to the emergency room with symptoms that you're worried about a stroke, you wanna find out when's the last time someone saw them and they were completely normal. Because if you found them like that, we're not exactly sure when the stroke started and it might not be within those first few hours. And this blood thinner, if you give it very early, it can break up the clot and stop the stroke. But if you wait too long, it actually um, doesn't really help very much and it uh, can cause fatal bleeding. So um, the benefit kind of goes away and we won't give it at all after four and a half hours. Now, we also have another option, especially for these larger strokes that tend to happen with AFib, which is that we can actually go in and pull that clot out. And um, that's very exciting. That's only in the last about five years that we've really been able to do that successfully and shown a benefit. And at first, it was the similar to the clot buster medicine. We could only do it in the first few hours. But more recently, we found that there are ways that um, for certain patients, we can identify um, characteristics that make it so that we can actually pull that clot out even up to 24 hours after the last known normal. So that's really, really exciting. However, the faster we treat the stroke, the better the outcome. We know that. So it turns out time is brain. And in every minute that somebody is having a stroke caused by a blood clot like this, what we call an ischemic stroke, we lose 1.9 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and seven and a half miles of myelinated fibers. That means the connections between the neurons. So it is disastrous. Every single minute counts. And interestingly, for every hour that a person is having a stroke and it's not treated, the brain ages three and a half years. So this is why it's so important to come in immediately with any stroke symptoms, don't wait. And so what are those stroke symptoms that we should be aware of? Well, we, we like the acronym BFAST. Some people have just used the FAST acronym, which is helpful, but I like this um, BFAST because it adds some other very common stroke symptoms. Now, the symptoms of a stroke depend on what part of the brain is affected because every part of the brain controls different functions of the body. But some important stroke signs and symptoms to be aware of would be sudden loss of balance, sudden vision changes, so that's what the E is for eyes, so that would be either loss of vision, completely losing your vision, or it's maybe double vision, um, facial droop, or weakness of one side or the other. We just put arm because we needed an A, but it could be arm or leg, or um, speech difficulties, like you can't find the words, and that it happens suddenly. And if you have any of these symptoms or someone you're with has one of these symptoms, the T is for time. It's time to call 911. So this is not the time to get a ride from your friend, and it's not the time to call a taxi. And the reason for that is that when you call 911 and the stroke ambulance comes to get you, they see that you're having a stroke and they call the hospital ahead of time and get everything ready for you. So you're going to come straight in and be taken straight to the CAT scanner and to um, have the neurologist meet you there. So that's why we really want everyone to call 911 for um, stroke symptoms, even if it seems like that would cause a delay. It actually is the opposite. So other important stroke signs to be aware of would be things like having suddenly the worst headache of your life or sudden loss of consciousness or sudden altered mental status. These can also be signs of a stroke. And importantly, they can be signs of that other kind of stroke, the bleeding kind of stroke. So super important to take those symptoms very, very seriously. And with that, I'm going to end and um, move on to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Vivian Ng is one of our interventional cardiologists. She is amazing in every way. And she is also an expertise at structural um, heart disease, which includes 
specific topics related to atrial fibrillation. So um, as Dr. Wan said, she's the electrician of the heart, um, and I am more of the plumber of the heart, which means that I am more focused on the blood vessels of the heart and ensuring that there's enough blood flow going down the arteries of the heart in order to make sure that the muscle of the heart um, is getting enough blood. But in addition to that, I've also spent additional training um, looking at the structure of the heart. So I'm also almost like a carpenter, if you will, at the same time. Um, so we all have multiple heart, uh, multiple hats that we have to wear. Um, and so for this particular talk, I'm more like a carpenter. So I'm going to be discussing what is the role of left atrial appendage closure in patients who have atrial fibrillation. So first off, what is the left atrial appendage? So as Dr. Jelani explained, um, there are multiple structures within the heart. Um, and you can think of it as the top rooms of the heart are the atria, and the bottom rooms of the heart are called the ventricles. Within the top room of the heart on the left side, there's this little outpouching here, almost like an open closet here. Um, and everybody has one of these, but everybody has a different shape to this left atrial appendage. And so you can imagine that as blood is swirling around in this top room of the heart because the atrium are not contracting well, it can then go into this small little pocket of the heart and start gathering there. And as I mentioned, everybody has a different shape and size to their left atrial appendage. And this is just some examples of that. And you can imagine that as blood is swirling around, it's going to get caught up in all the nooks and crannies um, within the left atrial appendage. So the rest of the heart would be like down here. And then this is just an outpouching and it's got all these nooks and crannies in here where blood can get stuck um, and hung up in here. And that's where many of the times clots will form when you have atrial fibrillation. And studies have shown that when people um, have clots within their heart as a result of atrial fibrillation, 90% of the time, the clots will form in the left atrial appendage. Now, Dr. Miller also discussed how important it is for patients with atrial fibrillation to be on blood thinners. And blood thinners help thin the blood so that blood clots are, don't form as easily within structures of the heart, such as the left atrial appendage. But sometimes people are not able to take um, blood thinners. And so for example, if you have had bleeding in your stomach before, if it, you've had bleeding in your brain before, if you have a very active lifestyle where it's just not safe for you to be on a blood thinner because you're at high risk of getting a cut or some type of injury, um, or if you're somebody who um, is at high risk of falls because you have balance issues, maybe because you've had a stroke in the past, um, then what other options are available to you in order to help prevent you from having a stroke? Recently, we have this new device, and it's called the Watchman device. Um, and this is to close off that small pocket that I had shown you in that first picture. Because I, as I said, 90% of the clots that are going to form within the heart when you have atrial fibrillation are going to form within that small pocket. And so this is just a small structure here where it does have these small uh, metal wires in order to form the structure of it. And it has a fabric on top of it that acts like an umbrella and it keeps the blood clots from going in and out of the, your left atrial appendage. So this is an animation here to describe um, how this procedure would go about if you were to have this procedure. So I will say that um, you would be asleep for this procedure. You would get general anesthesia, so you wouldn't feel any type of pain. And we do all of our visualization under both x-ray as well as a special type of ultrasound of your heart in order to see exactly where our equipment is going, to see exactly what that little pocket of your heart looks like. And so what we do is we take a small thin tube and we go into that big room of your heart called the atrium and we direct it into that smaller pocket or closet called the left atrial appendage. We then inject contrast dye into that appendage so that we can see the size and shape of it and we use x-ray in order to visualize that contrast that's in there. Once we're ready and we all agree to move forward, this is when we advance our equipment up that small thin straw that we have placed into that appendage. And then we're able to open up the Watchman device 
We then evaluate it again with the x-rays as well as the ultrasound of the heart. And as we evaluate it to make sure that it's stable and we ensure that we don't see any blood flow going around this device. Now there is this cable here that attaches it to our equipment. So if we don't like it, we can always adjust it. But once we decide that it's in its perfect position, then we can release the Watchman device. We just unscrew the cable there. The Watchman device stays, all of that equipment, like the small thin catheter tube that I mentioned, exits the body. And over the course of time, over about a month and a half period of time, the skin within the heart grows over this structure that we've now placed into the heart. So that blood is no longer able to flow into that left atrial appendage. So we've essentially closed off that small pocket within the heart where many of the clots would form. And this would just stay in place for the rest of your life. And so this study, this device has been studied quite a bit and patients who have received this device have already been evaluated for five years now. Mm -hmm. And we looked at patients who, who could not take long-term blood thinners for some of the reasons that I had mentioned earlier and who received the Watchman device compared to people who were taking blood thinners. And what we found was incredibly 40% of the patients who received, or sorry, patients who had received the Watchman device had a 40% lower rate of all types of strokes. And this is strokes that could be caused by either bleeding or by clots. There was an 85% decrease in the strokes that were caused by bleeding because these patients who received the Watchman device did not have to be on long-term blood thinners. And then there was a 60% decrease in the risk of death from all cardiovascular causes. Okay. And so what I didn't mention is that after the Watchman device is put in place and after that one and a half month period of time where the skin of the heart is growing over the device, we then reevaluate you to again, using, you know, CAT scan or sometimes specialized ultrasounds of the heart to ensure that the skin of the heart has grown over the device. And after that period of time, you would be able to come off of any type of blood thinner. And so this really helps to benefit people who are not able to take blood thinners for a long period of time. So who is currently eligible um, for this type of procedure? people who have um, atrial fibrillation that's not caused by a valve problem. And this is something that you can speak to your physician about. Um, and, these, uh, and if you are at increased risk of stroke um, and should be on a blood thinner, just like Dr. Jelani and Dr. Miller have discussed using some of our risk calculators to determine what your risk of having a stroke is while you have atrial fibrillation. Um, but you are also unable to take blood thinners for, again, whether or not you had bleeding issues before. Maybe you're on, uh, you know, mild blood thinners like aspirin or Plavix because you had a stent put in, um, if you have a very active lifestyle. Um, these are all things that you can discuss with your physician to see whether or not you can um, be a candidate for a left atrial appendage closure um, so that you can decrease your risk of stroke um, if you're not able to take one of the blood thinners that is traditionally used in order to decrease the risk of stroke. Now, I do also want to mention that we do have some clinical trials now in order to evaluate whether or not this type of procedure is helpful for patients who could take blood thinners, but would prefer not to be on blood thinners and would prefer to have the um, Watchman device. And so if that is also something that you are interested in, you can also speak with um, your physician um, and you could always, um, you know, come speak with one of us about that as well. Thank you. We've talked about some of the long-term problems that can um, happen with atrial fibrillation, which include um, uh, heart failure or weakness of the heart muscle, um, as well as uh, stroke, as well as you know future dementia. So this is definitely something that people should um, talk to their doctors about if they have risk factors. Um, I appreciate all of our experts, Dr. Miller, Dr. Ng, Dr. Wan, um, all of whom provide their own special expertise on this topic. Um, and if anyone has any questions, of course, we'd be happy to answer them off, uh, offline. But uh, I hope that you were able to learn something new about atrial fibrillation. It's something that is clearly a very relevant topic. There was a Wall Street Journal article um, just two weeks ago 
uh, that talked about how common atrial fibrillation is in the in the general population and how it's so underdiagnosed. Um, so hopefully this empowers everyone to look into their own heart health as always and um, and tune in for future programs. Thank you so much.